You're listening to Hear Arizona. Addressing issues, empowering our community. In the first part of our three-part inhospitable water series, we talked mostly about Colorado River water, how it's the lifeline of the Southwest, depended on by 40 million Americans, and drying fast thanks to climate change. We also touched on desalination, a very expensive way to suck water from the ocean. But there is one other major place we get water, the ground. When you think of groundwater, the image I'd like to use is that of a milkshake glass. This is Robert Glennon, the water expert that's worked at the University of Arizona that we heard from last episode. And we get groundwater with wells that pump it out of the aquifer, a kind of natural underground lake. An aquifer is like a milkshake glass. Over tens of thousands of years, Mother Nature has deposited water. But the problem is we've been withdrawing that water in mere decades. If we stick too many straws in the glass and suck too quickly, the milkshake runs out. In the 1980s, Arizona passed a law that regulated how many wells could go into the aquifer and how much water they could suck out. But that law does not apply in some rural areas. In those places, like Wilcox, Arizona, it's a free-for-all. So the economists call that a tragedy of the commons. It's a finite resource, but you're allowing infinite access to it, and the tragedy is, is going to unfold. And so the Wilcox area today is kind of the wild west of water. No rules. The only two things you need out of here, out in the middle of nowhere, is water and air. If you don't got water, you're shit out of luck. So now you've got zero regulations, just whoever has the biggest straw that puts it into the crown. You're just going to suck the water out, and then everybody else is going to be here suffering the consequences. Little people like us are not going to be able to afford to have a well. I used to have a beautiful yard. Now I've got rocks. In this episode, we go to southern Arizona to see the conflict that comes when the groundwater gets tight. And as always, when it comes to water in the West, agriculture is a big part of the story. The farmer in our last episode, Jace Miller, said he was afraid that small farms across America were dying out and being replaced by much larger, more industrial operations. And when one of these big farms comes to town, one expert told me, It invariably tears the community apart socially. They divide the community into two camps. Then there's kind of an animosity begins to develop. I'm against corporate capitalism, and that's what that is. There's a lot of animosity. They picked out a villain to blame for, you know, the water levels going down. You know what they say, whiskey's (laughs) for drinking and water's for fighting, so. (laughs) Through the story of one rural town, We'll look at how government regulations, industrial agriculture, and a shrinking underground water supply affects a community's livelihood and the health of the planet and people everywhere. From here, Arizona, this is Inhospitable. I'm Anthony Wallace. I drove three hours south from Phoenix, past Tucson, through the yellow-green mountains and plains of Cochise County, where the famous Wild West figure Wyatt Earp once roamed on horseback, all the way to the Sulphur Springs Valley. Wilcox is one of the bigger towns in the area. Riding with me is my friend and fellow reporter Luke Simmons. He works for the Ten Across Initiative, who we're collaborating with for this water series. We arrive finally at a restaurant attached to an RV park called the Chuck Wagon to meet with two guys named John. How you doing? Good, how are you? Good. My name's Luke. Luke, nice to meet you. You bet. I think John Hart's going to be here pretty soon. Okay. Can I get you something to drink? I'll take some coffee. Coffee? Yeah, thank you. John Shaver is a real estate agent. John Hart is a farmer. They're working together right now to start a water district that would provide running water to people in the area. Because right now, a lot of people don't have it. The long and short of it is, and you guys can argue the numbers, we're pulling out more, more water out of our aquifer than we're putting back in. 
In this valley, groundwater is the only reliable source of water. You have to dig a well, and people here are digging so many into the aquifer and pumping so much water out of it that wells are going dry all over the place. Digging a new well can easily cost $30,000 or more, way too much for a lot of people. But I look around at the community and I see neighbors that are struggling and just not able to afford it. I know some folks who hauled water for years, saving up so that they could drill a well. So the plan is the water district would drill a couple super deep wells, then build pipes going off of them to people's homes. Instead of having to drill your own well, you'd have a monthly water bill. But this whole plan is only for domestic water users, not farmers. And John Hart is a farmer. He said that when he moved to the farm he has now, about 15 years ago, he had one well per pivot. A pivot is a circular field of crops you can sometimes see from an airplane. But things since then have changed. But with water levels dropping and everything else, during the summertime I'll end up setting out two or three pivots and putting those wells towards the others. Mm. So the days of having one well, one pivot are pretty much gone. He's had his own wells go dry and spent tens of thousands of dollars digging deeper ones. And just like with Jace Miller, the rising cost and scarcity of water threatens his way of life. And it threatens the whole Sulphur Springs Valley. Yeah. But what about the uh, like the long term future? Because you know, like you said, it's no no matter how you look at it, you're taking more water than you're putting back. Do you worry about a day when it's I don't know, just too too far down there? <clears throat> there will come a day when it's economically not feasible to pump the water for irrigation, but. I think that by then it will it will have been a gradual process where we have drawn down, and hopefully we will find another uh, type of economy to support this valley. Right now, the valley revolves around agriculture, and agriculture revolves around water. I asked the Johns what reporters and people from the outside get wrong about the story of water in the valley. Well, I think they sometimes neglect to talk about the fact that this has been happening for 70 years. Um, you know, they kind of give a unfair, I feel, unfair uh, rap to farming uh, in general. I would say what a lot of reporters will gloss over or, or not get is what ag does for the economy. You know, they look at it as ag is taking all the water. You know, I mean, ag has its faults. There's no doubt about that. We have our problems, but we're, we are the lifeblood of this economy. At first glance, agriculture is not a big part of Arizona's economy. It directly represents less than 1% of the state's GDP and accounts for about 1% of the state's jobs. But farming is more than what happens on a farm. There are businesses that drill wells, sell tractors, process the food, and distribute it. A 2017 study found that agriculture contributes $23 billion a year to the state's economy when you take all that other stuff into account. And that would be closer to 8% of GDP. Also, Arizona produces a significant portion of the country's food. Only Florida and California produce more dollars worth of melons and vegetables per year. It's not like if you get rid of agriculture, all of a sudden everything's better. Now we have water. It's like if you get rid of agriculture, there's just nothing here. That's right. Yes. Yeah. You know. There... Well, I, I had the uh, Southwest. I had a you had a cheeseburger. Well, we created it quick, and then you guys can yeah. get to eat. Yeah, let's hey, go ahead and show up eventually. You want to leave? Yeah, I'll okay. pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the many blessings you have given us. Lord, we ask you to watch over us and be with us and guide us. Please bless this food, help nourish our bodies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John Shavers lived in this area his whole life. I like the wide open spaces. I can drive 30 minutes and be up in the pines and or go out to the Wilcox Playa and, and uh, when, when I was a kid me and my brother would go and we found little seashells out there even. There's just a diverse um, terrain here and, and friendly people and, and people care about one another. And you know, I go into the, po the post office and the postmaster, his son used to work for me. You know, and so I know all these people. I look at it as I get to talk to people I know all the time. Yeah. <laughs> when I came in here, uh, the lady said, do you want your usual table over in the corner? And so, you know, just that kind of thing, you know, that familiarity and, and yeah. friendliness. And, you know, I'd like for more people to be able to enjoy that. And I'd like for my 
my kids to be able to stay in an area like that if they want to. But I don't want something like not being able to afford to have water to be a, a reason why they would leave. But this small town is changing. In 2014, a company called Riverview came to town. They grow massive amounts of hay to feed their tens of thousands of cows, and their main product is milk for drinking and making cheese. In Wilcox, they've dug a lot of very deep straws into the aquifer. Many of them are over 1,000 feet deep. Some of them are over 2,000 feet deep. A lot of the locals' home wells are somewhere around 300 feet, and the concern is the big wells can pump the little wells dry. Around here, Riverview is referred to simply as the dairy. You know, the dairy has deep pockets. They've they've changed how the how the valley looks. I would say they're definitely by easily the biggest single farmer in the valley now. Um, but I don't look at the dairy as this big evil empire. Uh, you know, the guy that's in charge of it is just another everyday ordinary guy. Um, you know, he's just smart and, and knows has a lot of business sense. Do they have deep pockets where they can afford to pump water? Well, yeah. You know, I pay when I buy a bag of seed corn, you know, it costs me about $300. And I might buy, you know, two pivots worth or three pivots worth in a year. The dairy buys, you know, 100 pivots worth. And so they don't pay $300, they pay $200. You know, and so all of a sudden, when you get economies of scale like that, they can do more. And, and you know, let's face it, they, they provide over 200 jobs here, you know. Just that one company, that one entity. John Shaver and John Hart say the dairy is helping them out with the water district project, and they don't have anything bad to say about the company. But that's not the case for everyone in town. The dairy and the topic of water in general are very touchy subjects there. I called a ton of people down in the valley before I visited, and a lot of them were very passionate about the issue, but they didn't want to be interviewed. They didn't want to publicly complain or criticize the dairy. You know, and I know guys who have historically been outspoken about water, and I talked to one of them here not too long ago. He says, I'm not doing any more interviews. I'm not doing anything else. He says, I've lost friends, and nothing has changed, and I'm tired of it. You know, Riverview is a big target because they're the largest farm here. It's easy to get on a, to read a, to read an article that, you know, here's David and here's Goliath, and we've got to stop Goliath somehow, you know, rather than looking into the whole thing uh, holistically and saying, okay, what can we do to, to so find a solution for this issue? And, and that's what we're trying to do is coming up with a solution that works for everybody. You know, so. John Hart took us to one of the fields he works at and showed us some wells and the giant sprinkler system with tractor-sized tires that rotates and gives the pivots their circular shape. It was all very technologically advanced, mostly over my head. So it all goes, all this technology really does go to water efficiency. Mm -hmm. My single biggest expense on eight pivots was water energy costs. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd spend over a quarter million dollars a year just on energy to work on, to run wells. And so anything we can do to make that less expensive is good for us. John Hart is like Jace Miller from our first water episode. They're both doing their best to make a living. And Hart has hung on to his business when a lot of his neighbors have not. Small family-run farms contribute to a community feeling in a place, but economies of scale mean it's hard for them to compete with the big ones. Riverview has gobbled up smaller farms all over the valley, paying big money for them. So a lot of John's friends who ran those farms have left. Uh, some of them went to Texas and are farming down there. Uh, a couple of them ended up in Kansas, I think. But yeah, if I had my druthers, we'd have a bunch of guys that had 10 to 12 pivots each and I'd have a bunch of neighbors and, you know, it'd be a great community. But the reality of it is I've got eight pivots I struggle to make enough money for my family to survive in the in the way we want to. You have to have the scale. You need about a thousand acres to be scaled to make it work. The day of the small family farm, you know, that you think the Norman Rockwell picture, I'm sorry, it just doesn't exist anymore. 
Part of surviving financially for a farmer is making as much money as possible off the crops they grow. Like a lot of farmers in Arizona, John exports the hay he grows around the world, and he's proud people on the other side of the planet want what he's growing. Saudi Arabia is a big customer of exported hay. They have a lot of cows there, but not enough water to grow their food. So they buy it from Arizona and other places. Some people call this exporting water. Yeah, I guess the, the simplest way to interpret it is like, we have our own water problem, so why would we export water? <laughs> so what, what, do you, what do you think about that? Uh, I'm going to sell my product to the highest bidder I can get so that I can be here next year. Mm -hmm. And if that means it's going to go to Saudi Arabia, then I'm going to sell it to Saudi Arabia. You know, and that's, I understand what everybody's saying, but I need to survive to be here next year too, so I can provide jobs and, and you know, support the economy yeah. and provide for my family. I would rather our water not be exported. Um, I would rather it stay within Arizona. This is Regina Cobb. She's in the Arizona House of Representatives, where she represents her hometown area of Kingman. And Kingman, like Wilcox, is one of the places with no groundwater regulation. And she wants to do something about that. So now you've got zero regulations, just whoever has the biggest straw that puts it into the crown, or the most. You know, mm -hmm. you could have somebody that has 100 wells uh, next to somebody that has one well. Mm -hmm. And it, there's a good possibility it'll run that well dry. This has everything to do with exporting water and big farms. See, Cobb is not so vocal about farmers like John selling hay outside the state. But she is really concerned with big out-of-state operations like Riverview opening up here. One thing that attracts these big farms to move to certain parts of Arizona is that there are no limits on how much water they can suck out of the ground to grow their crops and cow food. And Riverview isn't the only one. In Kingman, there's a Las Vegas company growing an estimated 650,000 pistachio trees and one from United Arab Emirates with a 16,000 acre hay farm. In La Paz County, there's a 10,000 acre hay farm operated directly by a Saudi Arabian company. So when you do making hay and you're shipping it back to Saudi Arabia, that water is being mined for Saudi Arabia. It's not being mined for Arizona. It's not Arizona water anymore. And we don't have enough water to go around. So this is a huge problem. Cobb has proposed a bill that would give rural communities the ability to form a committee and impose their own regulations on groundwater pumping in their area. Cobb is a Republican. But she said water issues are nonpartisan, with Democrats and Republicans on both sides. And right now, she said this bill is being held up by Gail Griffin, a representative from the Wilcox area. No groundwater rules might make certain parts of Arizona attractive to mega farms with deep pockets. But this thing that is playing out in the Sulphur Springs Valley, a big farm replacing a bunch of smaller farms, is happening all over the country. What we've done is, is we've allowed those agricultural processing, distributing, retailing corporations have become so large, we don't have anything resembling what would be an economically competitive market. What we're doing is not sustainable. It's not good for the people. It's not good for the land. It's not good for the environment. It's not good for the rural economy. This is John Eichard. I'm a professor emeritus of agricultural economics uh, from the University of Missouri. Eichard is 82 years old, retired from teaching, but he still writes and speaks passionately about big farming operations because he's really worried about what they do to our health, economy, and planet. And in the grand scheme of American history, they're a relatively new phenomenon. I grew up on a small farm down in southwest Missouri, and we had hogs and chickens and, and milk cows and, and raised a few ducks and a few turkeys. But we probably got 70, 80 percent of our food anyway, uh, locally. And that's how it pretty much was all across the country in the early part of the last century. There were lots of farmers and they had a great variety of different crops and animals. But Eichard went to college. Eventually got a Ph.D. in agricultural economics. But I, I spent the first half of my 30 year academic career as a very traditional agricultural economist. He and his peers wanted to industrialize agriculture, use technology and economies of scale to make more food at lower cost so it'd be plentiful and less people would go hungry. 
But with time, he realized it created a few big winners, massive industrial farms that were very profitable, and a lot of losers, smaller family farms that couldn't compete anymore. Take hog farms as an example. In 1959, there were over 1.8 million in the U.S., and they averaged 37 pigs each. In 2012, there were 65,000, and they averaged over 1,000 pigs each. And then I began to look at rural communities that depended upon those family farms, and as we forced the family farmers out of business, those rural communities were drying up and dying. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we didn't do anything to reduce the level of hunger or food insecurity. In fact, we still have more people percentage-wise in this country that are classified as food insecure or hungry today than we did back in the 1960s before we started this whole process. So, you know, it was a good experiment, and we thought what we were doing was going to be good for everyone, but it turned out that, in my opinion, it simply didn't work. So Eicher did a 180. He basically started his career over again got a new job, stopped putting all his old published papers on his resume, and dedicated himself to fighting the thing he thought would be so good for the world. It, it's not easy to change, but I think I've told people my life has been better every day since. The animal farms Eichert is worried about are sometimes called factory farms, industrial farms, or the term he uses, CAFOs, Confinement Animal Feeding Operations. The U.S. Department of Agriculture defines a dairy farm as a CAFO when it has 700 dairy cows. Riverview has over 100,000 cows in Wilcox. And a major way CAFOs affect the immediate area is waste. Now, dairy cow in production will produce as much potentially toxic biological waste as somewhere between 15 and 20 people. So 100,000 cows equals the waste of 2 million people. That's greater than the population of Phoenix. But in Phoenix, there's a whole elaborate sewage and waste treatment system. The manure and urine from CAFOs can get into dust and sometimes seep into the water supply, making it toxic for humans. Cows also burp a lot, and they burp methane, a greenhouse gas that contributes to climate change. One researcher I spoke to said the cattle industry alone is responsible for 4% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S., and another big thing is antibiotics. CAFOs often feed their animals small doses of antibiotics throughout their lives so they don't get infections that reduce their productivity. And that can cause antibiotic-resistant superbugs to evolve and leak out of the farm and into humans. There have already been documented cases of this happening. The World Health Organization has explicitly asked farmers to stop routinely giving their animals antibiotics. A representative from Riverview told me they never give antibiotics to cows while they are actively milking. And in general, their cows only get antibiotics if deemed necessary by veterinarian protocols. But nationwide, animals are getting a lot of antibiotics. In fact, the majority of antibiotics sold in the U.S. go to livestock, not humans. Well, I tell people, eventually sustainability is not just a buzzword. It says, can you keep doing what you've been doing indefinitely? And we can't. Everything that's of any use to us ultimately comes from nature. There is no place else. And if you destroy the productivity, the ability of nature to support us, and the productivity of society, you can't sustain the economy. I mean, it's, that's what sustainability is about. And, and what we're doing now is not sustainable. We're destroying the foundation of future productivity. Eichert buys his meat directly from farmers he knows produce it in a way that's humane and environmentally friendly. And he says we need better government policies to support those kind of farmers. But that's tough, because the big farms... They have the political power because they're major contributors to political campaigns, state level, federal level, even local level. But beyond the economics, public health, and environmental concerns, Eichert said when a CAFO comes to town it invariably tears the community apart socially. And you can take a community that could get people together and do things and support schools and support parks and things like that, that lose the ability to come together and do anything because it's always the division. I thought about this a long time, why does it do that? And I think there's kind of a historic rural culture that says that it, it, it's okay if some people benefit and do better than others. But there's something fundamentally wrong with someone benefiting at the expense of their neighbor. 
And, and when that happened, I think it just kind of rips the social fabric apart. So, anyhow, right. that was kind of a quick tour down there. Yeah, but uh, so yeah. you got you got my number. Yeah. Direction. John Hart dropped Luke and I off at the restaurant. Well, can, uh, yeah, we'll see you later then. All right, sounds good. All right, see thanks you a lot. You bet. Right. We wanted to know what other people around town thought about water, wells going dry, and the dairy. So we went knocking on doors. <laughs> Out here, the homes are spread far apart. There are dirt roads and mountain views all around. <laughs> Hello. Howdy. Uh, my name is Anthony. This is Luke. Uh, we're journalists. We're just uh, down here talking to some people about, about the water. The water, yeah. This guy didn't want us to use his name, but he had a lot to say. When we knocked, he was working in the kitchen of his trailer home. They they put these big mega uh, industrial size agricultural things out here. Mm -hmm. And it's, the problem is not with a lot of little people doing this. It's with these guys that drill the wells down 1,500, 2,000 foot wells, pumping ungodly amounts of water per minute. He told us the water level in his well is dropping, but it's still pumping water for now. His neighbor isn't as lucky. So, and there's like this guy here straight to the east of me here, I mean west. They're an older retired couple. They had a well that just went dry, okay? and um, they don't have the money to, to deepen it. So he bought a tank and he comes over here, he's over here today and he filled it up and he took it over there, mm -hmm. off of my well here. So we went to see this neighbor. His name's Richard. Yeah, I'll call Richard right now and tell him you're showing up. All right, that'd be awesome. Okay, well, man. Yeah, we'll just head over there. Thanks a lot. Take care. Have a good rest of your day. Yeah, you too. Thanks so much. Richard Jimenez has a nice corner lot and a well-maintained yard, but it isn't green. Yeah, we've been dry for going on three years now. Really? I used to have a beautiful yard. The lawn, flowers, roses, and now I've got rocks. Well, there's a lot of people around here that are lacking water. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't see how anybody's gonna fight that multi-million dollar operation. Mm -hmm. I don't. The problem is they're drilling anywhere from 1,000 to 1,700 feet deep, 2,000 feet deep. Most domestic wells around here are around 300, 350. We don't have a chance. These people over here know that the wet, that this valley is going to go dry. They have a they know that they've got a 30-year lifespan. Richard is referring to a report that stated the president of Riverview's board called a local hydrologist and asked if their wells will last 30 years because they have a 30-year investment in the area. But Riverview has said that shouldn't be taken to mean they're going to leave in 30 years. Either way, and whether or not Riverview's drilling contributed to it, Richard feels the effects of his dry well every day. But it changes your life, it really does. It really does. My whole life I used to shave every day, I don't now. We don't use our, our washing machine anymore. I go down to the laundromat. I remodeled our kitchen, and there's a brand new dishwasher in there that's never had water in it. At this point, Richard seems pretty exasperated. We've looked into into assistance, uh, maybe grants or something. There isn't anything that'll help you out. Uh, anyway, and, you know, my wife is 76. She's not in good health. He thinks the water district is a good idea, but it requires putting in piping to all these spread out homes in the area. He's just worried it's going to take a long time and cost a lot of money. Richard said he loves it here, just like the Johns, and he grew up nearby. But now, he's thinking he might have to move. What do you think about the future of this area? I don't think it has one. I don't think it has a future. We left Richard's house to look for Greg Freeman's, another person neighbors said has thoughts about water. From the road, his place was impossible to miss. It looked like an impenetrable lot of tall trees. When we pulled up, there was a sign that said Forbidden Forest in the start of a narrow trail. It's got like pine trees in here. <sighs> oh, there you go, house this way. Oh, okay. It's a front yard you can easily get lost in. Hey, 
Hello. Hello. Craig? Yeah. All right, my name, is, uh, my name is Anthony. This is Luke. Howdy. Hello. Uh, we, uh, you want to come in for a minute? or? Sure. That's all right, right with you. Yeah, come on in for a minute. All right. I was just trying to find... Greg is 67 years old now. He lives alone, and he's been in this house in his forest since the 1970s. And, well, uh, yeah, I've been here for 46 years, and uh, I'm on my third well. First one went dry in 2000. He's had to deepen wells and dig new ones, and he said that can cost thousands. The new well to go to 554 was $20,000. Pretty much all the wells around here that were drilled more than uh, 20 years ago are either dry or they've been deepened, one or the other. I'm hoping that my well lasts until I die, but I better not live too long past 80 because I'm not sure it will. Greg has long supported regulating the groundwater pumping here, something Regina Cobb's bill would give the community the power to do. And he explained to us how sucking all the water doesn't just make wells go dry, it actually makes the land sink and crack. That's called subsidence. There's underground formations of solid rock, usually. And what happens is the, as the land shrinks, it separates from that, it sloughs away from the part that doesn't sink, and then you get these cracks. And what happens over time, especially when it rains a lot, water comes in and washes sediment from the surface and fills in the bottom parts of that, and then the crack gets bigger and bigger at the surface. They can be really deep. You never know. There were two sinkholes that developed over off a of Kansas settlement road that were 40 feet deep and 40 feet across. They just about swallowed the whole road and, and gas line and electric lines and all that. But on Dragoon Road, there's a sign that will tell you, beware, land subsidence, hmm. you know, slow down. That one's opened up a whole bunch of times. Greg does see the groundwater problems in the valley as David and Goliath. In a few years, what's going to happen is people, little people like us, are not going to be able to afford to have a well. And the farmers will be able to drill their wells deeper, which is what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. Because all, almost all the farming here, most of it, is to feed animals. Greg is vegan. He said he's been vegan since before vegan was even a common term, over 40 years. And that's relevant here because a meat-based diet requires a lot more water than a vegetarian one. Research has shown that if everyone in America gave up meat just on Mondays, it would save each year the amount of water that flows through the entire Colorado River annually. A livestock economy has to grow in scale by massive amounts to get enough food to feed these things and then make enough money on it. Mm -hmm. and, and scaling and growing bigger and richer is something Greg's never been really interested in. He lives modestly and he grows a lot of his own food himself. Now, I've made mostly less than $5,000 a year my whole life. And I've lived a wonderful life. I, people say, well, how can you live like I, I said, I live like a king. I eat the best food. I get organic goodies all the time. I eat and I get to do what I want most of the time. I mean, why do you need so much stuff? As I continue to report and read about climate issues, this idea of place comes up a lot. I love climbing trees. That's one of my favorite things to do here. Hopefully I can do it until I keel over and die. <laughs> The greatest joy in life is being connected to the land and to place. There's the idea of being somewhere for the long haul, investing in it, making it nice. And then there's coming to a place for a bit, getting what you can there, and leaving. Some people accuse the dairy of doing the former. Come in, buy land from established families and farmers, all with this 30-year plan to suck all the water up and leave the valley dry. I can't tell if that's true, but I can tell that Greg is in the long haul camp. When I planted trees here, I didn't blade the ground or disc the ground. I just made holes in the native grass and planted the trees there and mulched them. Foxes and coyotes and badgers and owls, they're all here all the time, bobcats and everything else, because they, they find this place and they're going, holy crap, you know, this is amazing. One year we had like two over 200 turtles here, box turtles. My idea is that this forest is a symbiosis between the natural forces and me. And hopefully it's coming out better than if they were on their own. I can, because what I do is to try and enhance their lives and not just because I think it should be that way. 
and I sort of live all my life that way. I'm hoping that I enhance your world right now just by talking to you for a while. Part three of this water deep dive will look closer at this idea of being in the same place for a long time and the knowledge that comes with that. And those who have been in Arizona the longest are Native Americans, and they have time-tested ways of surviving and growing food in a water-scarce desert. Thank you so much for listening. To be sure you don't miss our future episodes, subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen. This water series is a collaboration with the 10 Across Initiative. They focus on the future of the U.S. by looking at the most pressing issues in the southernmost states of the country. From California to Louisiana to Florida, those places are where water issues are most extreme. And if this episode sparked your curiosity or inspired you to take action yourself, You can find more information on the organizations we profiled and the issues they face on our website, herearizona.org. That's H-E-A-R, Arizona. There you can subscribe to our newsletter and find other podcast series on the most pressing challenges our state faces, like homelessness, aging, and funding for the arts. One of the best ways to support our community-based solutions journalism is to tell your friends about it. They can search for Here Arizona on their favorite podcast listening app, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, NPR One, Spotify. And since we're all about empowering our community, we want you to be part of the conversation. Follow Here Arizona on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. This podcast series is made possible by support from the Nina Mason Pulliam Charitable Trust, the Arizona Community Foundation, and Intel. Here, Arizona is a production of the Division of Public Service at Rio Salado College, which includes Sun Sounds, Spot 127, KBOC, and KJZZ. This episode was reported, written, scored, and hosted by Anthony Wallace. It was edited by KJZZ's Carrie Fair Snyder. Linda Pastore is the executive producer.